Hello and welcome to Bosca Presents, presented by Mama Sports Construction and CEI Engineering. My name is John Hartwell, and I am the designer behind Hartwell Studio Works, a sports branding shop serving the small college athletics market. Bosca Presents is a monthly series of live webinar conversations featuring athletics leaders discussing topics of importance for the small college athletics community. Our topics today, our topic today is branding and the bottom line. To talk about this topic, we have two guests from Lynn University in Boca Raton, Florida, and we'll get, meet them in just a moment. Audience participation after this webinar is encouraged. We'll have opportunity for our guests to answer your questions. Uh, after the presentation, please use the chat box to direct your questions to me as the host, and I will ask them to our guests. A quick reminder that we are recording both audio and video, uh, both of which will be available later on the web. Before we begin, we will hear from our sponsors, starting with Brian Morse, the Vice President for Professional and Collegiate Operations at Mammoth Sports Construction. Brian. Thanks, John. Uh, everybody, great to see you again. Uh, as always, Mammoth is uh, proud to be a partner with Bosca and um, support uh, the investment in small college athletics administrators. Uh, very appreciative of Jeremy Capo, one of our Assistant Vice Presidents, being named to the Bosca Board. And um, as a former uh, JUCO AD, I know that he's really looking forward to working alongside the rest of the board members and helping move small college athletics forward. If you need anything sports construction wise from turfs to indoors to uh, baseball fields, whatever it might be, um, we're your A to Z company. So don't hesitate to reach out to us and uh, we look forward to help you in uh, whatever way that we can. So, again, thanks and really looking forward to hearing Devin, one of the best in the industry. Thank you so much, Jeff. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, next, we will hear from Jeff Brzee, uh, the Sports Facility Design Team Leader for CEI Engineering. Jeff. Thank you. And again, we're uh, grateful to have the opportunity to be here and be a sponsor. Uh, once again, we're coming from the road along with Brian. Um, in this industry, we travel all over helping y'all out and willing to go wherever you're at for your needs. Our uh, company again we, we come here every month just want to remind you we are the design portion we're a civil engineering firm we don't do any of the construction like brian's company does but we're an independent firm to uh, be a resource for planning and design and bidding assistance or whatever helps goes on with with the project in those phases so we'd love to uh, speak with anybody who has any needs uh, long range goals or short range goals um, budgeting planning uh, get projects off the ground and then in that design, make sure the engineering's done right, uh, get everything uh, on paper so you've got, got the quality built into your project. Uh, reach out to us. Uh, you can reach us uh, uh, through ceiengineering.com's uh, website, or you can reach me on my cell phone. I've, I'll, again, text that number out when we're, we're done to the bottom line. Appreciate being uh, uh, able to be a sponsor and continue to be a sponsor to Bosca and uh, uh, thrilled with everything you guys do. So appreciate the time. Thank you so much, Jeff, and thank you, Brian, and thanks to both Mammoth Sports Construction and CEI Engineering for their support of Bosca Presents. Before we get started, uh, let's hear a couple of words from the founder of the Business of Small College Athletics, Jim Abbott. Jim. Thank you, John. Uh, limiting me to a couple of words is probably the, the best approach. Uh, just a, really a couple of things. I think the, the first thing I want to do is thank Devin and Sherry for their willingness to to join us today and share. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the presentation. Uh, the main thing I want to announce to the group is that uh, I'm really excited that we're going to hold uh, the Business of Small College Athletics workshop in person this year. Um, things in our community and our country continue to improve and, and I'm excited that we'll have an opportunity to grow in person. Uh, the workshop dates will be July 18th through the 20th. We're going to host that here in downtown Oklahoma City uh, and uh, encourage everybody to be on the lookout. Registration for that event will begin on April the 5th. So in the meantime, we're going to continue to do virtual sessions like this. Uh, we really want to serve small college administrators. So if you have a, a topic that you that you want to see covered, let us know. Um, uh, we're all in this together trying to grow. So uh, thanks so much again to Devin and Sherry uh, and for everyone who's participating today. Thanks, John. 
All right. Thank you, Jim. And of course, my thanks to, uh, to Jim for this opportunity to host this webinar on a subject that I'm very familiar with, on branding. Uh, as a professional sports designer, I know that the, the topic of branding can be rather abstract, uh, if not perhaps entirely uh, well understood, especially in regards to why it matters and what branding can do for small college athletics. And that is why I'm excited to have our guests join us today to talk about their experience with athletics branding and the impact that that branding has had on the bottom line of their institution. So I'm very pleased to welcome the Director of Athletics at Lynn University, Devin Crosby, and the Chief Marketing Officer at Lynn University, Sherry Weldon. Devin, Sherry, thank you so much for being here on Bosca Presents. John, thank you. Sherry, I'm glad you, she's joining me because this is the source behind the excellence we have at Lynn. Very good. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, to get started, branding can be an abstract topic. Uh, and so before we discuss how it is that branding can impact the bottom line, let's lay down some definitions. Sherry, as a chief marketing officer, uh, how do you define a brand? What is a brand? Is it, is it just a logo or is it something else? So in its, in its simplest definition, brand is experience. Uh, the logo is part of that experience, but only a small part of the experience. And so let's, let's use Coke. Coca-Cola um, is a way to illustrate what I mean, right? Um, people form their opinions of, of the product um, based on their experience with it. So Coke, they've been around 135 years. They've had the same red color, the same um, script logo um, that represents the same sweet sugar product. But if they change their color every year or their logo every year, they wouldn't be as easy to identify, right? And if um, sometimes when you ordered the, the Coca-Cola, it was flat instead of fizzy, um, or they changed the formula like they did with New Coke and lost billions in market share because it wasn't what people expected, um, you lose your, your trust. Um, you might try another soda. That's the same thing with brand if you're talking about um, a college sports um, um, team, right? Think about, think about consistency of the experience, right? If it, if the student athletes and the coaches weren't giving it their best every time they went out, um, if the facilities weren't consistently cleaned um, and, 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 manta and maintained, if the fans weren't engaged in enjoying and attending the games consistently, um, that is not the, the delivering on the promise of what that brand can be. So brand is experience and the promise of a certain experience and you need to deliver on that promise consistently in order to build and maintain your brand. All right. So uh, for Lynn, uh, Lynn did an athletics rebrand in, I believe it was 2014. Is that correct? Yes. So there are all sorts of reasons why an institution, whether it's an athletics program, whether it's an institution itself, uh, why they would uh, undertake that kind of rebranding project. What was it that prompted the need for Lynn uh, to, to do an athletics rebrand? Why, why was it important from the institutional perspective and why was it important from the athletics perspective as well? So when we started this out, we were um, a very relatively young athletics program, but we had had um, tremendous successes. We were, we were really punching above our weight, but because we hadn't taken the time to properly professionalize and think through and develop the brand, we were underselling ourselves. Um, and it's really important if you wanna gain the, the trust of fans and if you want to show um, donors that you're worthy for investment, you need to properly sell um, yourself. You need to show why you're worthy for that investment, why you're worthy for that, that time and commitment and, and, and support um, from your fan base. So um, let me show you a little bit. I'm gonna share my screen and I'll show you what we heard um, from some of our um, stakeholders when we began the, um, the process. Um, you know, they're saying, look, we're good. We are, we are good across the board. We play to win, but for as good as we are, we really need something to rally around. Um, the brand as it stood just wasn't resonating. It wasn't giving them something to root for. Um, and so we set out to do something that could champion our champions. So this is what the brand was in 2014. Um, and by brand, I mean, in this case, the logo, because at the time, that's really all we had. Um, we had a logo that was our you know, central identifier. 
Um, it wasn't a brand um, and it wasn't even a unique central identifier, as you can see there, so, you know, other, other schools beat us to the punch. Um, and the, the perception of the, of, of the logo of the, of the fighting night, um, people called him cute. They called him Marvin the Martian, the, the fighting smirk. Um, those were not the responses um, our, our national champion student athletes deserved. Right, we we wanted them, the, the students and the athletes themselves, and, and our and our employees wanted to be described differently. We wanted to be described as as, as loyal and fun and powerful um, and 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 victorious. Those were the 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 things that resonated um, in terms of how we wanted to be described. But but Marvin the Martian just wasn't doing it for us. Um, and so we learned from that feedback what we needed the new brand. Um, to convey um, and, and really to be meaningful to our students, we needed to show um, the Fighting Knights had spirit. Um, to reflect our faculty and staff, we had to show um, and represent the, the service um, that our community engages in. And we absolutely had it to show strength to exemplify our champions. And so spirit, service and strength became the brand attributes that we built the new brand on. Um, and um, we developed a whole visual identity um, around that core concept, um, chose colors, chose symbols that represented those things and built a, a structure that really could champion um, our champions. So Devin, from an athletics perspective, yeah. uh, what did you see at, at, about how this kind of athletics rebrand was, was helpful for the athletics program? Yeah, it's it's very interesting, you know, John, because my path to Lynn University really serves as a testimonial, as a follow-up to what Sherry just mentioned when we talked about this this transition from this uh, cute ide identifier, if you want to call it, to actually having a brand, and, and and I'll unpack it in this way: is I first heard of Lynn University um, from a professional sense. Uh, during their search process. And their search process started in January of 2015. So if you do the math, Sherry and her team, they start this brand um, uh, proposition, if you will, in 2014. So but by, by the time it's 2015, there was a brand in place. And being a former Division II athlete, I had heard of Lynn, but quite frankly, I didn't know where Lynn was. Um, I knew Lynn was good in sports, but that was really about it. But through my um, exploration of Lynn University to figure out, was this the right institution for me? I ran across a couple of, of, of videos and one in particular where Sherry was speaking in a video. And she said that the Lynn brand is more than uh, colors um, and, and logo. It's about what she said, the experience. So I heard her say that in the video. I remember I'm flying down to uh, Boca Raton, Florida uh, for the interview. And I said, okay, you know, that's nice. And when I arrived onto the campus, as you're looking at the screen right now, a lot of these, these symbols were across campus and not just in the gym. They were uh, through um, the residence halls. They were um, through the walkways on campus. And this is what I said, John, and to everybody here listening. I said, there's something about this institution. Either they really do a good job with their branding or there's something bigger. But here's where I'll get to experience, everybody, is that with every single interaction I had on my first two days of that interview, they were consistent with the brand. And what do I mean by that? When you talk about spirit, we, we summarize that word um, to honor. We treat people well, irrespective of how they treat us. So now I'm connecting this brand and this word spirit with what, what I'm being um, you know, presented to you know, in that 48 hours of the interview. Um, we look at that word service that talks about humility. We look at the word strength that talks about maturity and excellence. So when my two days were done, I remember sitting down with Sherry and I sat down with, with President Ross and I said to them, I said, there's something different about Lynn University. And they each said it in two different occasions. And what they said to me was very, very revealing. They said, we're not doing anything special here. This is just who we are, and we're just reflect, we're reflecting that by our brand, and that's something I really fell in love with. And we and and I don't even want to say we sell; I would say we live that every day. So when Sherry talks about that expectation or that consistent expectation, when you have an interaction with a Lynn person, whether that person is the president, 
whether they are the senior vice president for marketing in Sherry's role, whether that's the lead custodian or an assistant coach, or maybe a crazy athletics director who works there, it will be a consistent experience. And you're going to have honor, you're going to have excellence, and you're going to have humility in the, the driver in, in terms of those interactions. So is it fair to say that there's a real two-way interaction then between this idea of experience and then developing what is a unique look? If it was just a fancy looking logo, but it didn't have the experience aspect, it didn't have the culture behind it, it wouldn't mean the same thing. By the same token, if you had the experience, if you had the culture and you were being represented by Marvin the Martian, that wouldn't have said who you were either. Is, is that a fair way to put it? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. They go hand in hand. A good visual identity for a brand is authentic. It represents something that's real. And so I was a very fortunate um, you know, uh, marketer to come into an organization that actually already had the authentic culture. They know who they were and what they wanted to be. Um, and so our task was to build a, um, a visual identity that communicated that, right? And everything communicates, right? Color. Um, it conveys emotion, the words you use um, to describe yourself, the way you represent yourself, um, the way you, um, you know, you brand and put signage up in your, in your facilities. All of those things um, are part of the brand, are part of the experience, but the fundamental thing is who are we as an organization um, and, and does our brand identity, visual identity accurately convey uh, that to our stakeholders. And, and is that how you, you pitched it uh, to, to change that, that identifier, that Marvin the Martian identifier, because people can get attached to logos, whether they are quote unquote good or not, they get attached to them. So you've got to sell oh, yeah. the idea. They, they had them tattooed on their arms, the, oh you know, the champions that had won, you know, so it's not a, <laughs> it was a careful, careful sell, right? They were, they were attached to that and Marvin the Martian represented, um, you know, their time at Lynn and their wins. And so it was incredibly important for us to get our community involved in the change. I, I think they did recognize um, that we weren't really championing our ch championing championing our champions, right? I think they recognized that there was more that we could do, um, and the way we made them feel better about the change is make sure they were involved. And they were from the very beginning, from the um, you know from the messaging to the design. We actually had. Um, three different design variations um, along with the symbolism. And we presented them to the students during the grand opening of our Bobby Campbell Stadium. And they got a chance to weigh in and express their opinions. Um, when we designed the, the mascot, we had the, um, the students help us name the new mascot. Um, so that was a really important um, part of selling it in was actually um, making sure that they were involved and they felt like it was their process. They owned it. Um, it wasn't something that was being, um, you know, forced on them by somebody else. So with all that hard work going into a rebranding for all of this laying the foundation, um, how did the institution, how did Lynn define what success was going to be for this? Was it just a bottom line concern? Were there other factors involved? What did success look like for this project for the institution? So our our stakeholders were really emotionally attached to the Fighting Knights. I, I think if I'd gone in and talked about the, the bottom line, um, that wouldn't have been as important to them. I mean, that was important to our CFO. It was important to me. It was important to certain you know, administrators, um, for sure. But the fans, um, the alumni, the donors, the athletes, the coaches, for them, it was an emotional um, um, connection. So for us to gain their support, we really did talk about the benefits in terms of school pride, in terms of stakeholder engagement, because those were things that, that you can get out of a brand that were important to them, that they valued. And we knew that if we built a brand that, that, that created stakeholder engagement and school pride, then it was going to help the bottom line too, right? It's going to help with, um, with, with campus store sales um, if people feel proud of their color and their, and their logo. So um, for us, it was, you know, start with the outcome of, of, of the personal um, and know that it will, it will help, um, you know, on the bottom line as well. So from an athletics yeah. uh, per perspective, I, I'm sorry, Devin, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I was, John, I was just going to add on to this. You know, I, I think we, we all work in a very um, hyper competitive business. I, I believe we work in a fast paced environment. Um, and I believe that knowing who you are is half the battle to success. 
and, and I'm going to unpack that. And what I mean by that is the brand that we have, it enforces and it empowers each of us in the athletics department, also just in the, in the campus community to have that, again, that consistent approach or that consistent experience. So when you know who you are, you know how to behave, you make quick uh, decisions much quicker. You're not stuck um, into sometimes um, trying to navigate fluid environments. So I'll give an example. We have a $3.9 million agreement with Adidas. It's the largest agreement in the history of uh, Division II athletics. Um, you guys know the numbers. It's much bigger than most Division ones. And quite frankly, a lot of people called me when we got that deal and Sherry and I completed that deal and said, how'd you do it? And it wasn't a negotiation. It, it, we don't even, we don't play football. I mean, there are no eyeballs. We we're not on ESPN often. We, we come on ESPN sometimes, but not very often. Um, but we knew who we were and we were able to communicate who we are with Adidas and them understanding who they are. They were trying to change the world through sport and we're trying to change society by using sport as a platform. It was actually very, very similar things that we're trying to do. So I, I, that's almost like a, a little hint tip sheet I just gave everybody on the screen right now is that we didn't negotiate with Adidas. We just knew who we were. And clearly Adidas knows who they are, just like Coca-Cola and all the major companies. So we're no different. You know, I, I love what President Ross and Sherry will say is that at Lynn, one of our goals is to be the Microsoft um, or, or Apple of higher education, that consistent brand. We, we might not be the biggest, but we'll always be very, very consistent and we'll know who we are. Um, i give you another example about a coach. We have a, um, a coach in a sport who turned down a, um, a high resource five, I don't call them power five, but a high resource 65 institution uh, to come to Lynn University. So obviously they declined a lot of money and to be here and they're doing very, very well. And I remember asking this coach once they were here and I got word through the industry that they turned down this high resource 65 institution. And they said, Devin, I just wanted to be a Lynn person. Once I heard how you talked about Lynn with that conviction, that's something I never heard from high 60, high resource 65 schools or anywhere else. So I left my institution to be, because I wanted to be a part of the Lynn experience. And we do that with uh, recruits as well. Um, I challenge our head coaches. So you talk about John, about success story. Uh, every head coach at Lynn is required to do their very best to sign one division one type athlete every year whether that's a transfer or whether that's stealing somebody who turns down maybe a walk-on opportunity at, I don't know, X school, that's division one to come to Lynn. They're, they're challenged for that. But when they bring that young woman or young man onto the campus, I actually said the same thing every time. And it's not a secret sauce. So I'll share it. I'll tell the young man, I'll say, look at this experience that you've had, just like I had my experience a couple of years at Lynn. And I want you to compare that to your division one institutions. And once you get home and, and think about what's the right school for you and who's going to love you and take care of you and be consistent, we'll wait for your signature. And, and that's how we get most of our division one transfers. That's a, you might call that secret sauce. I, I think it's just, we know who we are. So again, John, to answer your question that you didn't even ask, because I beat you to a punch is really, that is our success story for understanding our brand. So I, I think from both of you, you've both talked about how, the brand isn't just the logo. The, certainly you want the logo to look nice. You want it to communicate a degree of differentiation, but a branding project will not be successful if you've not clearly identified who you are and the values that make you different. What are you representing with that yes. logo? And to use your term, Devin, that's the secret sauce right there is to be able to define those values and, and express them consistently. Is that a fair way to put it? Absolutely. And if you're lucky enough to have someone like Sherry Weldon, and I'm not saying that because she's here and, and, and she's a colleague, um, but I, I tell people behind Sherry's back all the time, I feel like she's my sister. We really connected early on in the interview process. I had a vision for, you know, I've worked at nine institutions in 20 years. I've been on like a witness protection program. And then when I finally got here to Lynn University, I saw all the mistakes that were made, and, and me included. I worked at one institution where we just unfurled the, the logo on everybody. We didn't ask for their advice or their opinion. And if you look at the institution right now, they're not even using those marks. And I was literally just 15 years ago. It wasn't that long. So I, I learned from my own mistakes and then to have Sherry with this overabundance of, of understanding, 
and then the relationship works very, very well. It, it's been very easy, John. Very easy. So, so let me ask this question. So two important factors that go into the, 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 the success of the Lynn Athletics rebranding, I think, are one, the on-field success with the multiple and counting national championships. And also- It doesn't hurt. Uh, it doesn't hurt, no. Uh, and then also the executive level support of the institution. That's, uh, that I, I think is also a very one. important part of this. Because that's a controllable. Sure, 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 sure. So um, for another program out there that perhaps doesn't have that same kind of winning success, uh, maybe doesn't have the same kind of institutional support, or maybe doesn't have either of those, what would you say in regards to uh, the the usefulness of an athletics brand uh, in that kind of situation is that still a useful tool for 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 an institution that doesn't have uh, the same type of environment that that you've got there at Lynn? Yeah, I mean, I might be biased from where I sit, but a strong brand is always a useful tool. Um, always, um, it's just how you get there might look a little bit different. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I look, I grew up in, in New York State surrounded by Mets fans. So I can tell you, you don't have to have a, win a winning record to have loyal <laughs> fans, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, I think winning is one possible characteristic of an athletics brand, right? And it's a great one um, where we were fortunate that we, that we had it here at Lynn. But but there are so many other positive traits. Um, you know, think about what we do. Devin said, "Look, we're trying to build a be better world. Education is a is a is a is a change maker, and 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 college athletics is is at the center of that, right? So, you know, um, what if it's just about realizing potential? What if it's for long relationships? What if it's about the love of the game? There are attributes and things that make um, a college um, athletics program um, important and relevant and real that don't." have to do with winning. Um, so you can have a, a losing season, but still have something to root for, um, you know, behind the, the common cause of the brand. Um, leadership, I, that's a big one. I understand how important it is to have buy-in from the top. And I think we were lucky here that Lynn's leaders recognize the, the, the value of branding. But again, it, it might be easier to have leadership behind you, but it's not impossible if you don't. If you focus on the things that you can control, or the things that you can influence, you just start smaller, right? You find like-minded um, colleagues to collaborate on projects. Um, you look for ways to improve processes in your own department or create incremental changes. And you can you can get there. I mean, for us, think about it. We had all the good elements in place. We had winning, we knew who we were, we had leadership from the top and it still took us five years and we're not done, we'll never be done. Um, so if you're willing to be patient, um, you can still get there. And absolutely, it's a valuable tool. It's worth doing. Evan, any thoughts on that? Yeah. You know, I, I'm just going to give two statements to, to, to really um, summarize this thought that I have, you know, that, that, that's come to me, is that I often will say that culture eats strategy for breakfast, it eats resources for breakfast. If you have a strong culture, one of the reasons why we had that um, South Florida showdown where we brought in 10 Division I programs a couple of years ago and we beat five of the 10. And, um, we did that on purpose because we wanted to show the, and we paid, and we, you know, we gave them the guarantee. We tried to flip higher education around. The reason why we did that is we wanted to show the world that culture always wins. But here's what I'll tell you, is that your brand program is the beginning of your culture. It, it, I don't know if I can simplify it anymore. Your brand program is the beginning of your culture and culture eats strategy and resources for breakfast. And from that, everything else is affected. It, it, it touches every part of, of your operation. Is that fair? Everything. Just before we got on this call, I'll give you a, just a quick case study. Is We had a student conduct issue. My deputy AD, uh, she calls me and how we worked through this student conduct, because again, it, it's not black and white, is we went through our culture. We said, how are we gonna honor that family? How are we gonna honor this young man who made a mistake? How are we gonna have empathy? Because you know we've all made mistakes too, but then how are we going to reflect the maturity and excellence of Lynn? We walked through spirit, service, and strength to get to our decision process on something that would take some athletics departments maybe six months to get through. And that had nothing to do with winning games but that's about culture. 
Sure. Very good. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the moment um, that we are in with uh, with COVID-19. Uh, I, I, I'm, I know everybody here knows that it's created something of an existential crisis uh, in higher education. Um, some schools we know have folded in the midst of all this. Um, some might, might be on the brink. Um, schools need every weapon in their holster uh, to, to get through to the other side of this. Um, Sherry, let me throw this to you as, as the CMO. Um, what kind of role can a, a well-defined, strong athletics brand play in helping a school navigate through this uh, whole and healthy? So I think athletics brands have an opportunity um, to help us heal and help us reconnect. Um, we've come off a very difficult year, right? People have been isolated. Um, they've lost trust in, in, in leadership and in institutions. Um, but athletic brands, um, what they're all about is sort of connection and community, right? So we can reinforce the in, important function that college athletics plays in an education um, um, community on a college campus um, and we can bring people together. Um, and that boosts morale and, and certainly having a common cause to root for during this time um, is, is something that's really going to resonate um, and, and help people um, as we get back on track. All right, so let's go to our final question here and let's get down to, uh, to some brass tacks. So for all of the work that went into uh, to this rebranding, uh, all of the focus groups, all of the thinking, all of the strategizing, um, what are the financial implications of doing this kind of rebranding? Did you guys use an outside resource? Uh, what are the hard costs of things like replacing uniforms, updating signage, all that sort of stuff? What's the uh, what's kind of the big big picture for uh, for executing that? So this will probably be good good news uh, um, for you. We we had virtually no budget um, whatsoever when we started this this process. <laughs> <laughs> no budget allocated, just a big, big goals and a big dream. And, um, you know, a lot of motivated people that were willing to help out. So, you know, the, the um, athletics and the marketing teams um, did all the work um, with the help of any volunteers we could get. We recruited um, folks from student affairs. We got we brought students uh, and student workers um, into the to the mix. Um, and we covered um, a lot of the hard costs for the initial launch launch, you know, paid advertising and hard materials and things that we, we needed to actually just, you know, get the, the new brand out into the market. We covered those from existing marketing budget. So we reprioritized that year and said, look, this is going to be, we're going to, we're going to, um, you know, put other things on hold and put some um, institutional resources um, behind that. And then moving forward, you can see from the screen, this was a, this was an, a, a long implementation. We agreed right off the bat with the CFO that we weren't going to incur a lot of capital costs and that we would replace uniforms. We would add um, branding and signage and update facilities as the um, as the sort of re normal replacement cycles um, um, came about. So each year we put a small budget aside for, for small projects and then throughout we, we added new um, you know, new projects are, you know, we were lucky the second year that the, that the gym floor was due to be refinished. Um, and we added a little incremental budget to add some new signage and what a transformation that made using existing, um, you know, budget that would have been spent anyway, um, to be able to, you know, to launch the, the um, the new, uh, the new branding. And then, you know, there are a lot of part of this that weren't hard costs, um, but maybe, um, you know, political cost or, or the effort of, you know, of, of human, um, you know, power, um, you know, really thinking about how we are going to operationalize um, this. We've defined who we are. We know who we want to be. How do we make sure we keep that consistent? Um, you know, Devin did a, a wonderful thing with his, um, his department. He, he built brand objectives into the performance metrics of the athletic staff, right? So this wasn't just a, a marketing thing. Thing where you guys are making us look pretty, we're actually going to be we're going to be measured whether we're in compliance with the brand guidelines, or we're going to be measured if 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 our um you know if our 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 culture and our our job matches the attributes of of, of what we want this organization to be. So that didn't cost anything. It cost Devin, I'm sure, some sleepless nights, but <laughs> there wasn't a a a dollar sign attached with some of those things. And those are are things you can't underestimate the impact 
um, that they had. They might not have been as visual um, as, you know, uh, refinishing the gym floor with a big logo, but they certainly probably had um, as big an impact or more in terms of keeping the, um, the brand consistent and helping us execute um, over time. So we just, you know, the answer is, um, you know, very little money, but a lot of patience. Um, and, and we got it done just by, you know, by planning and, and thinking it out over the course of a few years. Very good. All right. So that comes, that brings us to the end of our prepared questions. Uh, so uh, I'm going to open it up uh, for, for questions uh, from the audience. If you would, please send your questions uh, directly to me through the chat box. Uh, and uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll get questions started here with, uh, with Jim Abbott. Jim, fire away. Uh, Sherry and Devin, I, I guess I have a two-part question. Number one is the timeline. So from the start of the idea of we need to to revisit the brand to the rollout, how long was the timeline? And, the, and then the second part of it was, or is, was there a particular group that pushed back more on this than another? Uh, was it alums or coaches or... Was there one group that that pushed back a little harder? So those, that's my question. So the, the timeline for the initial launch um, was about a, a year from the time we started asking questions and getting the focus groups together to, to um, you know, develop the concept to the time that we went out and announced this is, you know, this is what we've um, we've produced. That's a pretty condensed, um, a pretty condensed um, timeline to create a lot of deliverables and, and, you know, and get all the marketing um, materials pulled together. Um, but we were motivated because we had, we were winning championships that the, the um, you know, we were launching our brand new, um, you know, soccer stadium and it actually created nice opportunities for us um, to do it. So I would say, you know, 12 months we did it, um, but it was crazy. And so if you're setting out to do it on your own, give yourself 18, you know, 18 to 24 months and, and a lot less gray uh, hairs uh, to do it. <laughs> um, on, on the, on the pushback, you know, that's an interesting, that's an interesting one. I, you know, I think, um, I think across the board, there were people that were attached to the way we we had done things um, that were here in the early um, days, um, who found the idea of, of, of change, especially change from outsiders, a little difficult, right? Devin and I were both new to the organization. Yeah. You know, we we were, you know, not sort of um, legacy employees that had you know worked so hard to build the program from the beginning, um, and so I think there was a, a little bit, uh, not in terms of maybe introducing a new look and feel, but in terms of new ways of doing things, you know, to, to be able to really consistently and professionally implement um, a, a brand like this, you need to be really tight on your processes, right? There need to be workflows, there needs to be collaboration, there need to be systems and, and tools in place. And it's not the um, just let's make it pretty and everybody go out and go forth and you know, um, if, yeah. if you slap the logo on the trash can, you did good. Thank you. It, it, it is, it, it requires a, a change in the way we work. And I think most of the pushback was that just because change is hard. People are busy um, and it takes time out of their busy schedules to rethink and restart and, and um, you know, um, change the way that um, they implement things. Um, so I would say that's probably, I didn't expect that. I expected more pushback on changing the visuals, but we really got more pushback on changing the way we worked. Yeah. And, and one thing I like to add to this, especially for, you know, all the athletic administrators that are maybe thinking about, because I, I do want to, I, I want to acknowledge a, a, perhaps a pink elephant. If you're an administrator, you may be saying, wow, they have this amazing person, Sherry Weldon. She did all this work and it just seems so free flowing, easy at Lynn. Yeah, perhaps. But I, I do want to explain to you, there is a way. And I believe as the athletic leader that you all are on the screen is that, there is going to have to be a high amount of humility. And, and here's what I mean by that. Um, one quick example is in year one, and Cheryl will remember the story, so she probably forgot about it, but um, our basketball team, they were taking their beginning of the year pictures, and I thought the uniforms looked really nice. Uh, they were white on the top, but the shorts were kind of like, almost like jams to kind of uh, be emblematic of the beach, because you know we're three miles from the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but that wasn't on brand. Now, I wasn't sure. I just happened to take a picture of it. And I think Sherry saw it online. And Sherry, following her processes, said, Devin, that's off brand. We got rid of the uniform. Now, I could have fought that and said, well, hey, 
but that wasn't the purpose. The, the purpose is, so I think as an administrator, you have to have a dose of humility to know who are the experts in a room. I'm not a marketing expert. I like marketing, but I'm not an expert. Sherry's the marketing expert. So if you as the leader can demonstrate that humility to whoever is the deemed term and expert on your campus for this campaign, that's going to go a long way. And it's going to help. It's going to help your social media people. It's going to help your uh, media, athletic media uh, communications group, because there will be some resistance if there are legacy people. It, it's just natural. Nobody likes their cheese moves. So I think as the leader, you're going to have to sh- really demonstrate humility, which is easy. That's free. All right. Thank you. And we've got several questions here coming in. So let me uh, let me start running through these from uh, from John Ashela. After uh, completing rebranding and having a new brand, how do you go about now increasing your brand recognition? Whoever wants to take that one first. You know, sure. I'll, I'll jump in real. I'll just, sure. I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I, I think what we do, just from an athletic standpoint, is we continue to seek opportunities to put our student athletes in front of the world, where people will say, "Hmm." And that's probably the best way I, I, I can explain that. What we're always looking for um, games versus teams out of our division. And that doesn't mean just Division One. What we're looking at exploring playing some Division Three schools that have been very, very successful. Um, we we continue to look to again recruit the highest level uh, of student athlete we can. Um, so we're doing everything that we can to show the world again. It's not just about resources; it's really about culture. Um, but it's a continued conversation in, in terms of, at least from an athletic standpoint, as ways we're looking to, you know, know further that brand. Sherry's going to give a much more technical answer that's going to be more helpful. <laughs> Sherry? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, one of the things that Devin does really well that continues to the steady drumbeat of, of recognition for the brand is he does a, um, a, a conference with the student athletes at the beginning of the year as they come in. Um, yeah. new students and the returning students, he calls it the spirit service strength conference. And the, the purpose of that goal is to create brand ambassadors, right? Remind them why they're here, remind them what the, the, the brand they just signed up for stands for. Um, and, and, you know, I, I saw a difference in that. Let me, I'll tell you a story. We had a, um, you know, we had a golfer um, that was winning and had a, an opportunity for international television um, um, who, you know, at first wasn't um, willing to support the the Fighting Knights brand. Um, and after yeah. some time and some exposure to the culture um, and the relationships, um, you know, with the teammates and the, and the conference, the following year when he got an opportunity, um, you know, to have a, um, you know, eyeballs on him from around the world um, as he played golf, um, he was sporting the Lynn brand. And that was probably one of my proudest moments. I was so happy. <laughs> Yeah. And so it's not yeah. always just the paid promotions and the in the in the big um, promotional items. A lot of it is in creating those brand ambassadors from the beginning because they'll be your 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 biggest voices out there in the world. All right. Next question from Ryan Cordova. Uh, we have an athletic logo and brand that, uh, and we also have an institutional historical logo that the the administration will not give up. This leaves confusion on bookstore and the marketing office with consistency. Yeah. Any recommendations, Sherry? That sounds like something that might be right up your alley. Yeah, yeah, and you know, we didn't start <laughs> out with a unified um, brand, a unified logo. We, you know, when I when we first started this branding process, we were doing it for the university at the same time as we were doing it for athletics. Um, and when I started the job, I think we had like 250 variations of the logo. Um, so if it makes you feel any better, you're not alone um, in that in that challenge. Um, we did our best to um, really put some decision rules about um, what logos to use and when. Um, and so with the campus store, we actually put a style guide together for the campus store with some merchandising strategy um, that defines here's the institutional logo, here's when you use the Lynn University um, logo, um, here's when you use the athletic logo, and, and things like the seal, the university seal, which is, you know, 
traditional. It's been there for the beginning. We use it for, um, you know, our diplomas. That's a very important thing, um, but it's not necessarily something that we use for branding. So we put rules around that, that it's like save it for the most serious moment. So with those rules, I think you can get people to, um, you know, to make sure that they're using the right balance and they're using the athletic logo when they should be, especially for merchandise. So you, you can coexist with multiple logos. It just requires some thinking and some ground rules and usage rules and, and good promotion of those usage rules. I'll, I'll second that also, just in my experience working with institutions and with athletic programs, there's, there's this tension between which logo do we use and, and what not. Um, and I would, I would put, I would put out there that it really depends on the institution. Not every two institutions are the same. Um, where you use the institutional mark versus where you use the athletic mark, I think depends upon a school's individual circumstance. Some schools are much more, have much more leeway in how they use the athletics mark. And some are like, nope, this is just going on intercollegiate uh, athletics. You will not use it for intramurals, et cetera, and so forth. Um, I would agree that the, that the institutional seal, uh, that's not a branding tool and that should just be on diplomas, but that's just my opinion. Um, Devin, any, uh, any thoughts on, on, on that particular question? Yeah, no, I, I would say well, well stated, um, John, what you said and what, what Sherry said, and, and I'm reminded of that. I think that that story of the, the golfer was a, a defining moment, I, I think, for, for us. And, and taking a young man, again, who was on a national stage, I mean, I mean golfing in the Masters. Um, and that, that was a large opportunity. And for him, and English wasn't his first language, so there were a lot of barriers that we had to explain um, because, you know, he wanted to obviously, you know, represent his country first, but for him to understand that being a student athlete at Lynn is bigger than you just playing games and going back to the spirit, service, strength, culture. So we reminded him of that. And so, yeah, I, I'm really proud of that moment. Sure. That, that, that's a good story. I forgot about. Um, so, yeah, no, well said. All right. Our next question here is from Sharif Hashim, uh, and he uh, and he addresses this to, to you, Devin. Uh, he says, Devin, Sherry mentioned branding objectives for athletic staff as part of their metrics. Do you place expectations on coaches or athletics communication staff in relation to social media content creation to enhance the Lynn brand? Ah, uh, okay. I thought you're Sharif. I thought you're going in one area, but okay, you went to social media. Uh, yeah, there, there is an expectation, Sharif, and. It, it's funny uh, if you were to call any of the head coaches at Lynn and say, what's Devin like about social media? They would probably all put their hands like this. And, oh, gee, this guy's like a tyrant because I am. And, and, and here's what I mean by that is that social media, in my opinion, is the front porch of your personality. It's the front porch of your, your, your conference. It's the front porch of your um, culture, if you will, um, or your, your institution. So, um, yeah, I have a, a lot of expectations, but what we do um, at Lynn University is we try to help our coaches. So we know not every coach is a social media expert. So for some of our coaches that don't feel that this is their bailiwick, you know, or their natural bend, uh, we have to do the work for them. Um, we'll actually help them with a, getting maybe a, a young student athlete who could just maybe take really amazing pictures for them and then give them the information that they can just post pictures or uh, some people will, will talk to, um, I think Bubba Baronel is actually on our call right now. He's our assistant athletics director for uh, marketing or, or for uh, athletic communications in our brand. And he'll work very, very closely with our coaches. So Sharif, to answer your question in short, you have a lot of high expectations, but I believe we give the resources. So the coach that doesn't like social media, doesn't want to deal with it. They don't look any different on the outside than a coach who actually enjoys social media to you as the end user. Sherry, I, I, this question was not addressed to you specifically, but it is about social media. Do you want to put any two cents about social media management just in general? Yeah, I, I do. And, and Devin's right about it, having a high expectation for social media. I think it's tricky, right? Because um, most of us use it on a personal um, basis and have um, that informal understanding of, of how to use it. And, you know, here's what I'm thinking at this moment. So I'm going to broadcast it. But when you're using social media to represent your organization and your brand or your institution, there has to be a different way of, of thinking about it. The consistency still applies. Um, you know, the the level of quality of the content still applies. Um, you know, so one of the things we're doing, it's actually a new um, tool that we're rolling out and we're working with Bubba on now is we, um, we're using Canva 
um, and we're creating uh, templates um, that can be used by the, the, the power users of social media um, so that they still have consistently um, branded um, and well executed um, uh, post, um, you know, because you've got people of varying different skill sets, um, that, you know, in terms of being able to use graphics or being able to, um, you know, visually um, um, tell stories. So we're creating sort of templated tools that'll make that job easier for them so they can focus on, um, you know, telling the athletic story and, and, and what's going on in, um, in life and not worry about whether the logo is properly uh, sized uh, and that they're using the right, um, you know, colors. Very good. All right. And let's uh, let's go back to uh, Jim Abbott for uh, an additional question from Jim. Go ahead. Thanks, John. I'm not, it's not really a question so much as it is really a statement. I think for all of us, you know, we just don't enjoy the wide exposure that, that um, larger institutions do. So um, I applaud Devin. I think the idea that as you're evaluating a coach, part of that evaluation is how you're using our mark is a great one. Um, in, in my experience on our campus, I mean, we we had 18 different looks, and it was, and none of them were effective. So, so part of what I would encourage everyone on this um, call to do is really contemplate how your teams appear from the perspective of someone outside of your campus. In my case, we're Oklahoma City University. But, but if, my, if my team is competing in uh, North Dakota and all they see is OCU on a jersey, they really have no concept of who that is. If all they see is a, is a screaming eagle on the hat, well, they have no idea who that is. And uh, so I just think um, that ought to be common sense. But over and over and over as we compete against schools, I look at I look at jerseys and I look at hats and I and I honestly have no concept of who who was our opponent today. So I just I, I want to applaud Devin that he's worked that into. I mean, it really is the culture of the athletic department. Um, and more so, just kind of a reminder for everyone that um, you really have to think about it from an external perspective. All right. And let's go. We've got one more question here from Karen Whalen. This is kind of a, a three-part question here. Uh, she asked, does Adidas have issue with the champion brand in the bookstore? What is the relationship between athletics and the bookstore? And is the bookstore a university owned entity? So uh, yes, Karen, it is a university owned um, entity. Uh, we do not carry Adidas exclusively uh, in, in the campus store, um, but we offer it, right, because of our partnership and because um, that's our premium um, um, line of apparel and the, and, and the, student, and the students want to wear some of the same stuff the student athletes are. Um, so Adidas is there, it's, it's, it's marketed and, and available as our, as our um, um, premium brand, but we do have um, other um, brands at different price points because that's Im important to us. And, and Adidas is, um, is, is, is a good partner that way. They don't expect us to have exclusivity in the store. All right, very good. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, then uh, I think uh, I think we can go ahead and say thank you to our guests, uh, both to, both to uh, Sherry and to Devin uh, for this uh, really great presentation. Um, I will share that when Sherry that when Sherry and Devin and I were putting this together a couple of weeks ago, I was afraid that I was going to get all nerded out and take two hours on this. So I, I, I think I've restrained myself. So thank you very much for <laughs> indulging me. Uh, and let me also uh, thank uh, CEI Engineering and Mammoth Sports Construction for their uh, continued sponsorship of uh, Bosque Presents. And I'll put up here on the screen uh, information to contact uh, both Brian and Jeff at Mammoth and at CEI. Uh, as Jim Abbott said at the top of our presentation, registration for the ninth annual Bosco workshop will be open in the next couple of weeks. Keep your eyes peeled on social media. Uh, we'll be getting that out there, and we are certainly looking forward to seeing as many people uh, as possible uh, in, in Oklahoma City for a real live in-person event. So uh, again, thank you everybody for being here. We hope this is uh, that this has been a, a useful help uh, for you. This The audio and video for this presentation will be available next week. Uh, be safe and uh, we will look forward to seeing you 
next time. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day.